City Fest because the gospel of Jesus Christ still works. And the community around Bridgeport, around Connecticut, we still have souls who need to be saved. And what better time than this to do that in this day and age that we are living in? People have lost their jobs. People are hungry. And this is an opportunity for us, the church, to bring hope and healing to a community that has suffered. The church needs to be the church. There's so much hurt right now happening in the world and in my community, so much pain, devastation, and Jesus is the answer. The good news of Jesus Christ brings hope, it brings joy, it brings healing, and I want to bring that to the people who I love and care about. There are a lot of people searching for hope, a lot of people who need hope and they don't know where to find it. An event like this is important for our community because an event like this heals our community. It reminds the surrounding areas that the church is alive, that Jesus is still on the throne. It also helps people within our congregations as they live their life to play a part and to play a role in sharing the message with their friends, their family, and just reminding people that Jesus is the hope of the world. To see the people of God praying for their neighbors, praying for their family, praying for the lost to come to, to know the Lord and then to see them respond is going to be a great joy. But even after City Fest and the relationships that are built are really the sweet part of City Fest. City Fest is actually a springboard into years ahead of lasting fruit, fruit to the glory of God the Father. This is no one church doing this, so it's going to take all of us, all of us play an important role into making sure that we win souls for Christ. It's exciting because this doesn't happen very often. Uh, very infrequently do we get all the believers across all denominational lines and cultural divides so that we can represent Jesus together and share his love with our community. It is not a flash in the pan movement. It is a continued effort for churches to walk together in oneness and in unity to continue even after the festival to work as a corporate body across the state. You may be the hand, I may be the elbow, but together we make up the body because Christ is the head and he wants to lead his one church. And if we can do that, there's nothing God can't do through us. Pastors, leaders, church members, I want to encourage you, get involved with City Fest because this is the church's finest hour to show the world what unity looks like in the midst of diversity. Let's come together and see what God will do when the church unites as one. So after, at the end of service, we're going to take up a second offering, okay? We're going to, and I want to say this now for you to prepare your hearts. Every dime is going to go towards City Fest. When Andrew and Wendy came and their team came for this Sunday, they're like, we don't want a penny. We're not charging you anything, which if you know people in the church, well, that is, and that is an amazing heart, and it's rare for a heart, they want to be here to serve this community, and every penny is going to go into City Fest to serve this community. So I want you to get ready for that. So without any further ado, I want to introduce, and this, I mean, he is exactly who he is. His heart is golden, but it, the greatest introduction I can do is I want to introduce my friend, Andrew Palau. Amen. <laughs> Thanks, my brother. It's good to be back at Kingdom Life Christian Center. We did have a good time here the other day, didn't we? It was awesome. Now, I can't believe my wife. Now would you see what it looks like when someone goes under the bus? Because that was what she threw me under the bus on my dancing skills, didn't she? I married a Jamaican woman. I'm so sorry, baby. I'll go out on the dance floor. She'd be like, come on, come and dance, come and dance. I'm like, oh, okay. Then I find get that. After about one third of the song, she's like, it's okay. You can go now. <laughs> you did a good job. I'm like, oh, I tried my best. And even when we were here, Israel kind of made fun of me. It, it, from some of you that were here, you remember, I think I distracted him. I got a, my beat, my rhythm threw him off of his beat, and he had to like almost stop and say like, what's happening right now? Poor fella. Anyway, I try to stay on the side as much as I can in those moments. But in this moment, I just say, thank you, Lord. I get to testify of the goodness of God. And I am so glad I'm a part of the family of God. And I'm so happy to be back here with you. Imagine that with over a hundred of churches all across Southwest Connecticut 
coming here to celebrate and have that amazing party. It was one big early step of coming together and preparing our hearts for City Fest in the season of evangelism and outreach and loving and serving our city. And as has been said over and over, that that momentum will carry forward through relationships, through the harvest. Those who come to faith will become like uh, fruit that remains, fruit that multiplies as we serve, making disciples together. It's a beautiful thing. And we'll have the women's events, the business and civic leaders will have a similar event. So that's for men and women also. So you'll hear about that. We'll be in the prisons. There'll be activities all across and then leading up to those two days. It'll be fun. There's extreme sports. So there, you know, the freestyle motocross and skateboarders and they jump so high. And this, this ceiling, you couldn't have them in here. They would hit the ceiling so fast before they even get off the end of the ramp, they'd hit the ceiling. If you have a weak heart, you're not allowed over there. Because, you know, it's that kind of thing. I always see it and I just turn away and walk away because I can't watch it. But it's for the young people, young families to help to invite them. The music, I know announcement it is coming in a couple of weeks once we secure the contracts and all the rest. But you will not believe what is happening uh, on the music scene and the worship scene at the festival. You'll be so excited when you hear it. I'm not very good at keeping secrets. No, I won't do it. I won't say. I can't. No, I don't know for sure. I have to wait. I've been under orders. But um, you will be excited when you see it. And then next, uh, next, no, this week, Thursday, will be that next beautiful high moment that you do not want to miss. If you missed Renew and you're hearing about it, you're like, how did I miss that? You heard about the celebration we had. Uh, this evangelism training that's coming up on Thursday is the next high unified gathering. So we're together around this, pushing forward in unity. But there's only a handful of places that will actually gather together uh, in preparing our hearts for the festival, and that is one of them on Thursday. I hope you'll get down there to Black Rock, put it aside, put it in your calendar now, and uh, that'll be excited. I also wanted to tell you, before we open up the Word and get into it, uh, the Lord has something for each one of us today from His Word, and it's going to encourage you greatly. I'm looking forward to it myself. Uh, The Lord is speaking, but uh, to tell you that you know you're not alone, even with all the churches here in Southwest Connecticut together, praying, loving, serving, and reaching out with the gospel, There are people all around the world praying for Southwest Connecticut in a very special way. All of our friends in Latin America, all across Africa, and all across the U.S., our prayer and intercessors team are increasingly focusing their uh, efforts to praying for you in this day. And pray for them as well. Some of these cities, our next festival after we leave here is we'll go to Manchester, England. Imagine a festival like this in England. It's difficult there. You think it's hard here? Go to the UK. It's tough sledding over there, so pray for them. Uh, they're, they're, the, the churches have come together in Manchester, England uh, for the uh, first few days of July, July 1, 2, and 3. Also, then we'll be here in Connecticut at the end of August, Cairo, Egypt, uh, and then into the fall, Buenos Aires, Argentina, and we just had a good report, maybe a possibility of going back to China. We go every Christmas for more than 20 years, but COVID, of course, has, uh, has us locked down in so many ways, but Pray for China. They're praying for us. Then Costa Rica. And there's a lot of uh, faith all around the world. And you are right in the midst of all that, in the middle of it. They're praying for you. Please pray for us. But I wanted to take our time now and really focus in on why we do what we do. Not we meaning Wendy and I, or we meaning even the Church of Southwest Connecticut. Uh, But why why would we as followers of Christ do what we do in terms of... uh, sharing the gospel, uh, testifying to the gospel. Uh, I want to tell you about the motivations. This is kind of like my little secret chart that I keep for myself in my Bible. My dad taught me this because I would watch my dad. My dad was a great evangelist, traveled the world. Uh, I've served with him for 28 years. Ever since the day I got saved at the age of 27, I began to serve my dad and serve the team and learn and grow all these years. Now I finally got over the 50% mark. Now I've finally been a Christian longer than I wasn't a Christian. I was 27 years without the Lord. Now I'm 28 years with the Lord. It keeps getting better and better. Am I right? It's better to walk with Jesus. And the earlier, the better, for sure. But the Lord has his ways. But uh, my dad, you know, I used to travel with him and carry his bags. And in the early days, I saw how much authority and the anointing on him and the power that God uh, 
moved through his preaching and people responding to the gospel in such a way, it was just astounding. And I was one of those that responded to the gospel when dad preached it. So the joke's on me. I'm like a poster child, you know, for how this thing can work. But uh, the funny thing was, uh, when you travel with him, like even right before he would go up to preach and you're in a cab or there's a driver, a friend in the church is driving us to the, to the place, the stadium or the church or whatever. And dad would be like furiously taking notes and he seemed all nervous. I'm like, what is he nervous about? He's a champion, you know? And he would say to me, what should I preach on, Andrew? I'm like, what do you preach on? You, how would I know that you're going to preach on? I just got saved myself. You know, he's like, ah, forget you. And like, turn to the driver. You got any words of wisdom for me? And I'm like... What is wrong with him? And I started to understand that, like, no matter how long you walk with God, you always need something fresh. You always want God to speak to you. And he kind of got nervous. Like, and, and so when we tell people, you know, you got to pray for your friends with the prayer card, right? Pray for your friends and invite them to know Christ. And you're like so nervous. I want to tell you, I feel the same way. Even Luis Palau felt the same way. And I'm probably better up front, or at least I'd feel less nervous proclaiming the gospel up front than I do like one-on-one. Wendy's really amazing one-on-one. And I watch her, I'm like, wow. And her dad is amazing one-on-one. But all of us have our gifts. That's what that relationship evangelism will encourage you about is how can I use my gifts the way God made me and the circumstances of my life you are not discounted you are not on the sideline you are right front and center with the gifts and the, and the relationships God has given you we want to encourage you how to uh, maximize that to, to, to make an impact for the gospel wherever you go in the life of the festival for sure but like for the entirety of your life that's why that training is so great uh, you're going to see all that. But uh, I, I get nervous like that, just like you do. So I made this list. I kind of stole it from Dad because I would pick his brain like, you know, how do you stay motivated, Dad? Uh, what keeps you going? And how do you get over that fear and insecurity? And he was sharing some things, and I've added some things. Um, you know, when you follow in the footsteps of a great person, just like Marco has to do, right, Janine? Right? Uh, you, you just sort of feel like everybody will say to you, you know, you don't have to be like your dad. Um, and you're like, I wasn't trying to be like my dad, but I, you know, I'll take it to heart. I'll, I'll try not, I'll just be yourself. And then once you do the thing you do, then they come back and they'll say, you know what your dad used to do? And I'm like, Hey, I thought you were the one that said I didn't have to be like my dad. And now you're telling me I should be like my dad, but you know, that's how life goes. But here's one thing my dad did that I also do. He would, uh, make, make his sermon up and he would come up and he would say, today I want to preach out of this passage and I've got 17 points. And everybody's like 17 points. You're supposed to have three points and cut it short, you know? And he'd be like 17, and then he's on like number nine, and he's saying point number nine, but he's really, I've got like 13 points in my notes, and it's very confusing. So that's one thing I kind of get guilty of, because you get excited when you, when you look at the Word, and you start making notes, and you have things to share. But I have cut my big list down to four, then I put it back up to five, okay? So in that way, I'm just like my dad. But these are five reasons, and you'll come up with many more. Share them with me, because I like to build up my list. Uh, Motivations for why we do what we do. Why do we share the gospel? Why do we take this story to the world? I have five reasons why we take our faith into the world. And I I pray today, I want to encourage you, God wants to use you. He wants to do miracles in your life and through your life. Just like Wendy said, I think it was Wendy who said, like, you know, it's not just for ourselves. Remember the woman at the well? She, 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 she needed living water, but not just for herself, so much so that it would fill her for all her needs and all the purposes of her life, but then to overflowing. And you saw the way she did it when she went right into the city, immediately upon her her conversion, she went right into the city and said, come see a man who told me everything that I've done. And many people believed it said because of her testimony, but many more believed after she introduced them to the Savior. It's a beautiful story, and you remember it full well. But I'm going to just go through here, and I pray that you'll grab these for yourself. Biblical 
motivations of why we're active in sharing our faith. And the first one is beautiful. The first one I have is simply obedience. No surprise. That's a great foundational place to start. The master has laid it right before us, and it's so exciting. We all call out to God, and I hear young people, I go to seminaries, and then they'll say, we call out to God, and we say, I just want God to speak to me. I want to know what he would have me do. I want to know what my purpose is, and I can't seem to find it. And all the while, he has told us exactly what we're supposed to do, and it's in Mark 16. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. So that's that big picture obedience. Go. In Matthew 28, he says, go and make disciples. He doesn't say like, suggest people become disciples. He says, make disciples, baptizing them and teaching them. And he says, and don't be afraid, because I get afraid. I already confessed it. I, I know you must feel that insecurity at times. He says, don't be afraid. I will be with you even to the end of the age. You're not alone in this challenge and this call that we should obey to go and make disciples. And you know, sometimes you can sort of say, well, am I involved with that? To what degree is my life invested in this. And the simple things you can do, a couple things you can do is look at your calendar and see in your calendar, in the week, in the month, in the year, where am I investing my time in anything that is purposefully directed at ministering to those around me who don't know the Lord, praying for them, uh, uh, spending time with them purposefully in light of eternity. Uh, where does your calendar show it? Where does your checkbook show it? That's one of the great ways. Uh, one of these fundraising guys, um, a business guy in Portland, Oregon, uh, a lifelong friend, he's a... Uh, uh, an advisor, you know, like a financial advisor. And he says to me all the time, he says, you know, uh, there are no fakers in front of the checkbook, right? When you look at your checkbook, you're just like, and see, is there or isn't there uh, uh, evidence of me making the investments for eternity and in relationship for evangelism? Um, it, it, and, and now on your phone, I left my phone over there, which is good because it distracts you. But uh, on your iPhone, they have something called screen time, I think it's called. Are you familiar with that? And it's like this thing you didn't even ask for. And all of a sudden, it pops up and it starts telling you how you're doing with your time and are you spending it right? I'm like, I didn't ask for this kind of help from you, buddy. But uh, it, it's kind of one of those things. It monitors uh, uh, your productivity. So we have all these ways in which we can sort of examine it. But in the end, Christ, Jesus Christ, is our example. And in Luke 4, 43, he said, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God in this town and in all these towns as well, for it was, I was sent for this purpose. We want to be like Jesus. We follow his example, and his example is that he must go and preach the good news of the kingdom. And he reminds us endlessly. He says, remember, remember, remember. Never forget. And he, he tells us in the word of God to remember what he has done, who he is, what he is like, who he is to us. And then he even gives us some mandated practices, these like sacraments uh, uh, that remain. Baptism and holy communion. When we take the, the Lord's Supper, these are the things. He says, do this in remembrance of me so that you won't forget. And he says, don't forget who I am, why I came, the impact of my ministry, uh, the cross where I laid down my life. He, no one took it from me. He says, I gave it up freely, and I gave it for you. And now I want to do it through you. That's why I sent my Holy Spirit, uh, that you would have power beyond yourself. It was the power that resurrected us in the first place, right? It brought us from death to life, and it's that same power that inspires us and empowers us to use our gifts, use our relationship uh, to win as many people as possible to Jesus Christ. And, and, and there's kind of a simplicity to it, and you can find your own way. I was thinking of this example. My, I, I mentioned Wendy's so good at one-on-one -on -one stuff. She wins all the ladies to, to the Lord in the neighborhood, and then I get the, the men, you know, and they're like trailing behind. Men, why are we so slow? Anyway, I kind of pick up the pieces with the men and try to figure all that out, and we've seen so many people coming to Christ, but we learned a lot of it from her dad. My dad was a great evangelist. Her dad is a businessman, a chicken salesman in Kingston, Jamaica, uh, and uh, and he wins people to Christ every single day. You cannot go anywhere with him in a taxi, on the street, at work. And, and the moment he gets an opportunity, he'll share with them about what Jesus Christ has uh, done in his life. 
and he, he, he had this encounter. So this is how he does it. Just a little example. And, and it's sort of like quick and clear. He had, an, he had a time in his life as a young man where in his office, uh, he called out to God. He said, God, I'm not leaving this office until you tell me what to do and help me. And, and he had heard this voice from the Lord coming like from the walls where God said to him, Robert Levy, how do you expect me to help you if you have not given me your life? And he got on his knees, he confessed his sin. The Holy Spirit of God came and his sins were forgiven by the cross of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit of God came in to empower him, to give him the power that he needed that he didn't have in himself. And and he knew that great assurance of eternity through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And his moment, that moment transformed his life. It was radical. So every time he's, this is what he does. It's such a, such a simple little trick. You can find your own way. You're in a taxi. He's arguing with the taxi driver. Wherever in the world we are, he gets the taxi drivers, poor taxi drivers or, or Lyft drivers. And he'll be talking to them, engaging them. There's an argument or a conversation. And then finally he'll say like, He'll, he'll, he goes this direction. He says to the taxi driver, this, this taxi, this is your office, right? And they're like, what are you talking about? It's like, well, this is your office. This is where you live your life, right? And he's like, yeah, yeah, this is my office. And he says, just like I gave my life in my office, you can give your life to the Lord in this office. And I'm like, that's not going to work, Dad, but you never can believe it. Like, it's like it turns a corner in people's minds, and they're like, yeah. He's like, you don't have to go to church. You can give them your life right now. Would you like to do it? And it's amazing how many people just given that opportunity, be, being offered that gift uh, of eternal life and the forgiveness of sins, how many will say yes? So that's a little example that I've been trying to learn from. Like, what is my story? How can I turn a conversation so quickly, simply, uh, confidently? I've seen so many come to Christ in that way. And how important should all of this be for us? 1 Corinthians 15 uh, verses 1 to 6, Paul sort of summarizes all these things and at the end he says, I want to remind you of the gospel that was preached to you, what I received. We, we were saved by it, we stand on it, and I pass it along as of first importance. This is your priority, Paul tells us. So the first reason, that first motivation for activity in sharing our faith and sharing the good news is obedience. And I hope that, like, that should be all we need, right? The master said do it, so we should do it. However, he knows us so well. He's so kind. He doesn't just leave us with the commandment. There's much more uh, that, that can compel us and encourage us. And the second thing that I, that I have on my little list here is that Christ's love compels us. He is our example. Luke 19, 41, it says that he saw the city and he wept. He wept tears. His heart was moved. And he says, you know what? If you guys keep quiet, even the rocks will cry out, right? I don't want to be that guy. I don't want to be the guy that's standing before the Lord and is like, remember those opportunities I gave you? And then I had to make the rocks cry out? No, I want to be faithful. If a rock could convince them, I guess that's maybe what he's saying. That's kind of mean. I don't mean it for me. It's in the word of God. So you take it for yourself. It's like, come on, rockhead. That's what I think of the Lord saying to me. The rocks will cry out if you don't do it. So I just want to do it, and I want to be a part of it. What a privilege to be a part of it. He's given us the opportunity. This is what the abundant life is all about, seeing people come to faith, miraculous things happening in people's lives, just like it happened to our life. That's what life's all about. Mark 6, 34, he saw the crowds, and he had compassion on them. Christ's love compels us, his example of it. Do we not have compassion for the people wandering the streets? We were there ourselves, right? We were at rock bottom, and someone faithfully came to us. Matthew 9, 36, he said, Ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers. The, worker, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. And, you know, he said, he looked out over the city of Jerusalem, and he saw the crowds, and he wept because he saw that they were like sheep, without a shepherd. And he said, if you, only you, Jerusalem, had known on this day what would bring you peace. 
We know what will bring them peace, right? We have that great secret. Uh, It's like a pearl of great price. We don't want to keep it for ourselves. He sees the 99, and he recognizes the one. But he also looks at the 99, and he sees that they're all just a bunch of ones, right? He's not intimidated by the crowd. He's not intimidated by the size of the task. Those, the big hordes of people, they're not a hassle to him. He loves them, and he loves them one by one, just like he loved us and brought us forward. And we want to be those faithful people. You go through the streets of the cities around the world where we go, even in our own hometown, in my neighborhood. I see the young people. I see the anxiety and the harassment on their faces. You hear the statistics, and it's brutal. And, and, uh, you know, every day you think of these young people in particular, the festival, it's for everybody, right? So young and old, please come. But my heart is especially for the young people. You see their faces, and you know the truth of the matter, especially because of Technology, the advancements in technology, if you want to put it that way, uh, rivers of garbage unceasingly flow into their faces and into their hearts and their minds, and all that garbage is meant to capture their hearts, to drag them away from the Lord, and primarily just for money, right? Billions and billions of dollars being invested to capture the hearts and minds of our young people, to drag them down, primarily for self-interest of whoever those people are out there trying to capture their attention. We need to make our investment because we have this incredible hope uh, to provide for them. They're looking for answers, and we have these answers. And it's an impossibly cruel world for these young people, isn't it not? And we see that. It's like an impossible thing. They see all the garbage of this world so much more vibrantly, right? Like these screens are getting so incredible and bigger just so they can see so much of what they see. Vibrant, graphic, consistent, harsh violence, abuse and harassment, confusion, negativity just pumping and pumping and pumping at them at a younger and younger age as well. And it's a very, very difficult thing to watch. We have our children, and our hearts are broken for them. And Christ's love compels us to say, we want them to know peace, and we will not let all of that garbage take over their life. So we serve the, 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 the gospel, and we act personally out of obedience and out of the compelling love of Jesus Christ and his example. So that's number two. The third thing I love is that there's a sense of urgency, and I know this motivates me a lot. Sometimes I get complacent. I look at Proverbs 24, verses 10 to 12, and you remember this passage. I I read it early on. There's an urgency. I don't know where this person's going to be tomorrow. I don't know where I'm going to be tomorrow. Wendy and I and our family, we were in an airplane crash 11 years ago, and we learned so many lessons in that plane crash. A big 737 crashed on the beach of Jamaica and broke into three pieces. By God's grace, not one person was killed. I had some stitches, bumps, and bruises. It was shocking. Uh, uh, like an instant of horror that transformed our lives in a lot of ways. One of the ways is I have no idea where people will be tomorrow. Life can turn in an instant, and I don't want to waste another moment. Plus, I see, maybe more importantly than that, Proverbs 24, and throughout Scripture, we see this sense of urgency. It says, rescue those being led away to death. Hold back those staggering towards slaughter. And if you say, I knew nothing about this, does not he who guards your life know it? And will he not repay each person according to what they have done? What a beautiful idea. God is so good to remind us. I I resonate with this because I was there at the age of 27, staggering towards slaughter. When I first got saved and I read this, I was like, wow, this is so perfectly describes my situation. Staggering towards slaughter. What does it say? Uh, uh, Being led away to death. And I just pictured my life. It's like I was walking, like with blinders on, unaware that there was this line that just dropped off into this dark pit. And I foolishly walked on that. People, it's a rescue operation. There's an urgency to it. And we see in John 17, you sense it in the cry of the words of Jesus coming straight from his heart when he says in that John 17 passage, at the height of his passion for for encouragement us what we should do. Right before he went to the cross, he cries out, righteous father, the world has not known you. 
That was his passion, that the world would know the Father. And now he's passed that sense of urgency into our hearts. Moving quickly, number four, that same passage goes covers two points. So those are great passages, right? It talks about the urgency, rescue them, right? But then it talks about this other point that I think is very good for us to remember. Number four, point number four. So it's obedience. What's the other one? Obedience. His love compels us. There's a sense of urgency. Number four is it's for our own good. You notice at the end of that passage, it's like God says, I will repay you for what you have done. Why should he have to repay us for what we have done? We should be doing this out of obedience, right? But he just knows this is the abundant life. It is for this purpose that we were created, to be involved in God's activity in the world. He has a purpose for you. You don't just work at some hotel. You don't just work at the car dealer. You don't just work in that corporation. You're not just looking for a job for no reason. He has you out on assignment, searching for people who we would put into relationship with, that God would use you in your circumstance is no accident your circumstance. The relationships around you, don't begrudge them. You recognize God has appointed me to be in this place for this purpose. And I pray that you will realize it's for your own good. Philemon 1.6 says, I pray that you'll be active in sharing your faith so that you'll have a full understanding of all the good things that you have in Christ Jesus. I thought it should say, I pray you'll be active in sharing your faith, Andrew, because I need you so much, says the Lord. What? No, he does not need me, but he's chosen to use me, and it's a kindness that he would include me in his work. We are yoked with God himself in his work of seeking and saving that is which is lost. What a privilege, and it's for my own good. He says, I pray you'll be active in sharing your faith so when you're active in sharing your faith, uh, you'll, you, you begin to grow in having a fuller understanding of all the good things that you have in him. It's a beautiful thing. Meditate on that. I'd like to go for I got this whole huge list of reasons why that works itself out, but I'll send you the notes maybe. I'm going to skip to number five. But it's kind of obvious how it works itself out. There's a spiritual reality that as we're active in sharing our faith, uh, 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 we, we begin to understand all the good things of God. But there's some very practical reasons. You think about it. You'll, you'll recognize it for, this, for yourself. Um, and it's good for our life in this world now to be active in sharing our faith and operating as we were created to be and experiencing the abundant life, observing God doing miracles around us. It lifts our spirits and gives us motivation to go forward right to the finish line. And it's also good for us for eternal reasons that are mysterious. But let me just read one passage. As we grow to a fuller understanding of all the good things we have in Christ, Daniel 12.3 says, for our eternal good, Daniel 12.3 puts it this way, Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those who win many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. I have no idea what that means. How on earth is my life going to shine like the stars forever and ever? And young people are looking for purpose. I just want my life to count. I want to know, how about if you let your light shine like a star forever and ever? Is that good enough for you? I don't know what it means, but I want it, and I'm going for it, and I'm trusting God for it, and I experience it. When I fall away from this activity, my life gets bland. No wonder, right? When I get involved and I see God working in people's lives and that he's using me, man, everything comes alive. And I get this great excitement about life and eternity. This is the way to live. Skipping ahead, point number five. It's gratitude, right? 2 Corinthians 5 and 6, read the whole of chapter 5 into 6 verse 2. He says, as God's fellow workers, I urge you, Do not receive God's grace in vain. Wow, what a challenge. Have you received God's grace in vain? All these good promises, they're yours. They're not going to be taken from you. The forgiveness of sin because of the cross of Jesus Christ. We didn't deserve it. What a beautiful gift. He lifts the shame and guilt out of our life. God's grace Don't receive it in vain. He's given you power for the purpose of acting in this world, not just to hang in there, but to be active in sharing your faith. 
Don't take God's grace in vain. And the promise of eternity, how could you save that for yourself when you see what's happening in this world? I'm so glad for the faithful ones. I'm grateful for those who never gave up on me. I was born and raised in a great Christian home. My parents loved me, practiced what they preached in as much as is possible. They're normal folks. We got issues, believe me. But uh, they were great, you know. They loved the Lord. Uh, and they were transformed by him, growing and changing. I had a great church just like this. I didn't see a lot of hypocrisy there or any such thing. I suffered no terrible abuses. I am without excuse. I had every opportunity, every blessing in life. But despite all those blessings, I'm ashamed to say, from the youngest of ages, I turned my back on the things of God and the way of my family, and I ran after all the garbage of this world, alcohol and drugs and all the relationships that go along with that parting lifestyle. And I'm ashamed to tell you, but it's no surprise to you, right? And my poor parents, they didn't want that for me, but they weren't surprised. They knew the truth of the word of God. The Bible says all of us like sheep have gone astray. Each one has turned to their own way. They knew that full well. They had better hopes for me that I would come and know the Lord from the youngest of ages and always walk with him and always serve him. And my brothers came earlier, so that was a blessing, but they had to make their choice too. But I just went so long, so far from the Lord, destroying my life, becoming such a mess, and it broke their hearts, and they didn't know what to do except for they did this, just like what we're talking about today. They prayed for me, and they shared the gospel with me. And they prayed faithfully for me. We could talk about that all day, and we probably should. But that's what that prayer card is all about. When we think about the festival, that prayer card, it's not just like a gimmick to remind you, the Palau guys are coming to town, right? We're going to have a party down there. We are going to have a party, the greatest party we've ever seen in Southwest Connecticut. But the purpose of it is we're going to war for the souls of people, our children and our neighbors and all of Southwest Connecticut. There is a war on. The enemy is destroying lives, and we want to lift them up to eternal life. It's a war. They prayed for me, and they prayed faithfully for me. It's, it's, it's significant what we're doing here in this moment, what we'll do on the 9th together at Black Rock, and all the ways that we'll carry forward right to the festival. And that's just the beginning, of course. We move forward from there. Um, they prayed for me, but they also shared the gospel with me, and they tried everything. Dad was a you know, mass evangelist, crusades, but he didn't just rely on crusades for my life. He went one-on-one -on -one with me. He wrote me letters. He sicked people like you guys after me, and I would see you coming. You know, it's like, oh, no, here they come. Uh, and I know what's on your mind. They're like, can I take you to lunch? I'm a friend of your dad's. Oh, sure, sure. And you're at Denny's, right? And they're they got the napkin out. Who's on the throne of your life? And you're like, oh, this is so awkward. And like, Oh, I got to get out. And somehow I just weaseled my way out of all those things. And I'm, I, it sounds like I'm making fun of it. I'm so grateful. Those faithful ones who persevered through those awkward moments and rejection over and over and over. How did my parents carry on? You know, you want to give up. The burden becomes heavy. You feel ashamed almost. You're like, what am I going to do? I've tried everything. There's no hope. But the Holy Spirit of God breaks through. He is orchestrating lives and circumstances. He's the one that does it. The Bible says no one comes unless the Father draws them, right? Let's give him a hand. He deserves it. Oh, Heavenly Father, draw them. We can only do so much. We're trying, Lord, but we're in your hands. Lord God, be merciful. Draw them. We will be faithful to declare the goodness of God. We will testify. We will share the good news, but, but we're in your hands, Lord. Only you can draw them and soften their hearts. And I'm so grateful that my parents... In all that heartbreak, in all the discouragement uh, of their lives related to our relationship and the direction I was going, they never gave up. They persevered. Finally, at the age of 27, I was living far away from Oregon. That's where we live. And our, uh, my mom's an Oregonian. Dad's from Argentina, but he got drawn up there, just like I made Wendy move from Jamaica to Oregon. Poor people. But anyhow... <laughs> What was I saying that for? Oh, we were there. So I moved all the way to Boston after graduating university, and I was working my way up the corporate ladder and uh, just partying like crazy. My life was a mess. I had a mask to show the world. Everything's fine, but I was going in the pit, and on that day, out of the blue, the Holy Spirit prompted my parents to persevere through the awkwardness of it, uh, and they called and said, son, we're having this festival. You should come, and I was like, no, thanks. <laughs> That's easy. Uh, not my idea of a, fest, a holiday. Been to a few Christian festivals before. But then he said, 
Then, then dad said, well, that's okay. We just thought you might be interested because this one's in Jamaica. And I was like, oh, Jamaica. Hmm. <laughs> Hold on. Don't be so hasty, dad. Maybe I can work something out. And I'm thinking about red striped beer on the beach, get some sun. I love, I love reggae music. What a weird thing for a guy like me out in, out in Oregon. I could tell you that story. But I had to love reggae music. So I'm like, oh, okay. And I love fishing. So I, I made him get me a fishing trip. What a weasel. Oh, what a terrible kid. But he's like, okay, okay, I'll figure something out. He gets me this fishing trip with this family, which happens to be my wife's family. There's the cats out of the bag now. But uh, that's another other story. But uh, I went out there. I'm thinking about this. God had other plans. He was drawing me. I couldn't see it at the time. But looking back, how beautifully he was drawing me and preparing my heart. My parents couldn't have seen it. You're thinking of the people that were asking you to put on your prayer card, and you're like, I'm not putting them. It's too rough. I can't do it again. Put them on there. You have no idea. Ask God for the open door. And even if it doesn't feel like an open door, just say, I feel like you prompted me, Lord. I'm going for it. Make the invitation. Even if it's just a seed sown and they don't come, someday you're going to get the breakthrough. And for them, I came. I went to that festival. Long story short, I'm there with thousands of people. I hear the good news, and it's my time. And I just ask God, God, if you're real, I want to know, will you please forgive me? And you know what he does. If you confess your sin, he is faithful and able. Forgive your sins. Cleanse you from unrighteousness. And he did it in a moment. Moment of transformation. Amen? Amen. He will do it and he'll do it again. I've just gone long and I share all that with you though to encourage you that uh, you would never give up even on the most difficult people. Amen? Amen? Never give up. Pray for them. Live the life. Let your testimony be strong. You think people aren't watching your, your life? They're watching your life. They want to know. This person keeps saying they're Christian. How is it different? Are they walking? Are they changing? You don't have to be perfect, but they can see the transformation and the growth in your life. Don't get stuck where you are. Your life and your testimony, they make a huge difference. More difference than anything I could do for that person's life. Your prayers, your testimony, and share the good news. Bring them to the festival, and we'll believe for them together. Amen? Amen. Well, let's pray. Let's bow our heads. And I want to join you in lifting up the names on your cards. Let's just pray for them. Um, and some of you might say also, I'd love to pray for my friends and invite them to know Jesus, but I'm kind of actually more like where you were, Andrew. I got to get my life together. I knew him in the past, but I'm, I'm not walking with him. How could I testify? If you've wandered away, I want to lead you in a prayer that you would come back to the Lord. Don't worry about what people will say. Don't worry about the mess and the tangle of sin in your life. Ask him to forgive you and put you back on that narrow, straight, beautiful path of abundant life so that you can share with, with authority and with joy about what Jesus is doing in your life. Some of you may say, I, I've never known him. If that's you, give him your life today. We stand here saying it's a beautiful life. So let's pray. And if that's you, you can just follow me to say, Heavenly Father, I do believe in you. And I receive you now. Thank you for paying the penalty I should have paid when you died on the cross. To forgive me, please forgive me. Thank you for forgiving me. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Thank you for coming in. I believe in you and I receive you now. And I thank you for heaven, my home, and I will never fear death again because now I know from this day on, my name is written in your Lamb's book of life. So I come to you. I will walk with you. Transform me and use me. Let my prayers and my efforts lead many also to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Well, I have gone long, if you hadn't noticed. Praise the Lord, right? Not for that, but just for who he is. Not that I went long. One last thing. If you prayed that prayer, coming back to the Lord, and it's a serious moment, or maybe you've never known him and today you prayed, would you just raise your hand so I can see and rejoice with you? Anybody here, say, today is the day 
Just raise your hand so I can see it. I want to rejoice with you. It's a great day. And pastor will tell us what to do next. Anybody? Beautiful. Okay. These are personal decisions, but they're not private. You need to talk to someone. Let them know what God has done, and we'll help you to grow and go forward, okay? We need you, and you need not us, and we'll rejoice together. Here comes Pastor Marco. Marco, come. Take it away, or I'll never stop. Oh, my Lord. I love you, buddy. You're a patient man. Give it up for Andrew Palau and his wife, Wendy. Come on. I have never so lovingly and encouragingly been slapped upside the head like that before in my life. And I know what you, a lot of you know what I mean when I say that. We've heard the simplistic truth of the Lord, of the Word of God, for all of us in all of our lives put in such a loving way of saying, let's get out of our seats. Let's get out of our heads and be who God has called us to be. And for some of you that prayed that today, there was a couple of hands that went up in the room, and I know at home your hands went up also as you prayed that prayer, whether for the first time or a rededication time. If that was you, we want you to text right now to the number on the screen the word belief. Text believe to the number on the screen, whether you're at home or in the building, because we want to connect with you. We believe today is a new creation, a new story, the new life, part of the Lord's family, and we want to invite you in and talk to you, answer questions, and welcome you home into the kingdom and here at K KLCC. If you're in the building after service, right outside at the guest center, we would love to meet you. We have a gift for you, but we would love to connect with you and talk to you about the next steps. If you're online, text that word believe, and we want to connect with you. Amen? Amen. Listen, 